Hi, welcome to CMO Insights, the podcast series. I'm your host, Jeff Pedowitz, President and CEO of the Pedowitz Group. Today is our guest, we have Mike Kunkel, who's Vice President of Sales Effectiveness for Sparks IQ. He's also a best-selling author of The Building Blocks of Sales Enabling. Mike, welcome to the program. Hey, welcome, Jeff, and thank you very much for having me. Hello, listeners. Hello, listeners. Sales effectiveness, uh, big word. And, you know, it's been around as a field for a long time, but I think more than ever these last few years, changes in digital buying behavior, changes in customer control, the, the role of the modern seller has probably changed as much, if not more, than the role of the modern marketer. So what are some of the trends that you're seeing and, and why are you focusing so much on this field? Well, I, I've been uh, I've been around since dinosaurs roamed the earth, Jeff, right? So I've seen a lot over the years. Um, and I just haven't seen on the buyer side the rate of change and accelerated change that I have seen probably in the past five years and even more so, obviously, since the pandemic. So one of the things that I've been harping on for what seems like forever to me is the need to migrate from a far more transactional, old school, seller centric selling model to more of a modern buyer centric consultative selling model. And the odd thing about that is that Matt Cannon first published his book on consultative selling, I think 72 years ago this year. And every single week I hear somebody say to me, you know, we've got to move from selling transactionally to consultative. And so it has been like watching a glacier crawl for all these years, right? And, you know, until the glacier gets there, you can see it. But until it like sneaks up on you and goes over your landscape, you know, things are forever changed. But we have been really slow in the sales profession to adapt and evolve compared to what's happening with the buyers. And now you look at all the research from the buyers and they're not pleased with the average salesperson. And I want to be careful when I say that because we both know that there are sellers out there who are really good, who are consultative, value focused. They are buyer centric and they've operated that way for years. But it's this one to five, maybe 10 percent of elite sellers. And then we've got this the, the rest of the pack. Right, that are the ones who were sending me the inmails I get every day on LinkedIn, you know, with the most horrible approaches or oh, everything is everything is about them, right? The 10 paragraphs with a calendly link. Hey, book some time on my calendar. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So for me, this really has just been a, a long-term hunt for how do we raise the effectiveness of the way we sell to better serve the buyers and you know the, the, our customers. I remember Jeff hearing Zig Ziglar say, I bet 35 years ago, you get what you want in life by helping enough other people get what they want. And that hit me pretty hard as a kid, right? I was young, I was in sales, I really wasn't very good. I was doing all of the, you know, five ways to close the sale and feel felt found and isn't it, shouldn't it, wouldn't it, couldn't it, don't you agree stuff. But I wasn't having a lot of success. And so I accidentally ran across consultative selling and then Ron Willingham's integrity selling, then Linda Richardson's books on, on selling. And I started to get this different view into what selling was all about. And that radically changed things for me. And so, you know, I've been on a hunt for years to try to help more of the profession move in that direction. And I, I guess that's the, uh, the big why for me. Oh, well said. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned Zig Ziglar because uh, my parents were both in sales when I was a kid and they worked for World Book Childcraft and uh, they had a track player in the car. So I'm really probably dating myself now, but uh, I would listen to Zig Ziglar and Dennis Waitley and all these other guys in the car and they would take me to their sales conferences. And so, yes, I have those words reverberating in my head as they got would get themselves psyched up for a, a sales call or a, a field meeting. Uh, what, you know, you, you mentioned the slow pace of change. Why do you think it's been so hard for sales as a profession to change? I wish I had a really good answer for that, Jeff, but my, my best guess is that is what I call momentum fuel, right? The, the people who are in leadership positions still today have been in sales, many of them for a long time, 
It's almost like college hazing, like fraternity hazing. Well, this was the way that I was brought up, and this was the way that I sold, and this is the way that we're going to sell. And sometimes I refer to that as the harder, faster, longer, louder method of sales management. And I think that in until either the economy or a buyer revolt speeds up that pace of change, um, I think we're going to do what we think works. And I'm sort of doing air quotes there for our listeners. And this is this is one reason why I think I mentioned those people that send me all these horrible in mails on on LinkedIn. Right. I a couple of times have tried to coach these people. And it's amazing what I hear back. You know, if you send out the same horrible message to enough people, you're going to get some percentage that respond to that and that actually do something and, and, and eventually buy because of it. Uh, maybe uh, you hit them at exactly call calling, right? I mean, right, yeah, maybe you, maybe you hit them exactly the right time when they were already thinking about this. And what Chet Holmes used to say, that was about 3% of the market was already in the market for what you're selling when, when you reach out to them. So they get, this, they get this positive reinforcement. I did this thing over and over and over and over, and look, it worked, right? <laughs> and yet they don't have any clue how much better it could actually be if they improve their approach. And I think I think that behavioral pattern is is what keeps a lot of us stuck in the past. Interesting. So, but there are a lot of changes and technology has become disruptive. Um, you know, I, I've seen some reports now that buyers could be 90, 95% of the way through their journey before they're gonna speak to a salesperson. So given that in mind, then, what are some of the first steps a, a sales professional needs to, stay, to take to where you are in? So if your buyer is already there and you're still, you're, you're, you're playing catch up in a lot of ways, right? So it used to be we were ahead, we had all the information, we could control, but now the buyer's ahead. So what do we need to do to get catch up, get into alignment? Well, I think we have to recognize, we have to recognize that first of all and believe it. And I, I think there's still some disbelief out there in the, in the sales profession. But if you think about this in the way that we could map it out, you're going to approach some people at the very beginning of the what I would call the customer life cycle, not just the buying process, but their overall life cycle with you. They don't know who you are. They don't know if they need what you've got. And, you know, you're a relative stranger and you're trying to create awareness and interest and build a relationship. You're going to you're going to reach out and make contact with other people. But we're at the very beginning of recognizing, hey, we've got a problem here that we ought to try to solve. And I don't think we've got the expertise internally or the tools or whatever we need to do it. You're going to reach out and find other people who are well down the path of talking to your competitors and other vendors like you. And then you're going to have to try to get yourself inserted in that. You're going to talk to some people, right, you know, and have to create the opportunity. And you're going to approach some too late where they're already implementing something like you've got. And now you're going to have to move into a nurture thing with them. And so I think we have to stop treating sales like it is one thing. Where that buyer is in their journey and their life cycle, rather, matters on how I need to adapt to approach them. What I ought to be doing, right, and you'd know this from a marketing perspective better than anybody, I need to have really great buyer acumen. I need to understand my personas. I need to know the challenges, opportunities, impacts, needs, outcomes, and priorities that they want. And I need to know how my products and solutions fit into that. It can help them move from point A to point B, from current state to where they want to be. And then if I identify that ICP, I can start to approach them proactively. Now, at the same time, even though I'm doing that, there is still this buyer life cycle, and I don't often know where they are when I'm reaching out, quote unquote, proactively. I still may run into people who are already in the middle of an RFP or a buying process and have to try to insert myself in. But if I'm being really proactive about it, I might catch a lot more people on the front side. Now, even that doesn't solve the entire problem that you've brought up. Buyers like to research stuff on their own. So if we just think that, you know, here we are with our bag of tricks and we've got everything that we're going to need to guide the buyer through this journey, 
you would better be thinking about digital solution rooms or sales rooms, as some call them, where you can set up a uh, an internet space or a site and you can load it with the things that these buyers might want to look at and research on their own without you being there every second of the of, of the journey. You need to have the right collateral for each of the buyer personas to help them make the decisions they need to make in the current stage to feel comfortable to moving forward to the next stage. And you have to do what uh, what a Lego, uh, one of our partners wrote a book on virtual selling and they introduced this concept of front stage selling and back stage selling. And I really like this, right? The, the front stage is what we would think about. We're on camera or we're in the room and we're actually having a live interaction. It's It's synchronous, right? But there's a lot of stuff that you can do as a seller to stay top of mind asynchronously back of the house. The documents and follow-ups and send, you know, things that you send after you run a really effective meeting where you had a preset agenda, you did sales call planning, you knew what the buyers wanted to accomplish, you ran that meeting like a pro. At the end, you leave time to talk about, hey, so here's the summary of what we talked about. Here are the decisions that we made. Here are the open issues. Here are the here's the action plan of who's going to do what by when. And by the way, now we're going to ham bam, right? Which is a funny acronym for have a meeting, book a meeting. So you keep the momentum going, right? Now that was how you did a live meeting, but before that, you did that agenda planning and maybe asynchronously by email or chat, you know, got the buyer's perspective. At the end of this, you're going to create a great summary, whether it's a recording or a transcript, or a pared down version of that, recording of you summarizing it, a, a Word document, something that you can provide them that allows them to share those things internally with other people. If you're putting it in a digital solution room, you can add that content to the room and then watch who they actually share it with. Now you're managing front stage and backstage, and you're really guiding more of the buyer's journey that they want to do at least somewhat digitally. I don't think many sellers, Jeff, or have really thought all the way through this about how they can better manage that customer life cycle, how they can better manage the buyer's journey, and how they can interact with them asynchronously and synchronously in more effective ways to get the higher win rates. And so I, where can where can marketing help out in this process, right? Because I don't know oh, how it's, it's huge. For to, yeah, today's salesperson not going to be able to come up with all the content on their own and, and know what to do. So where where can marketing play a role? I'll tell you what, this is huge, right? First of all, help the organization understand and develop what I call buyer acumen. Like it's it basically like business acumen, but about your buyers. Who are the personas, first of all, that are in most of the, the deals? And do those personas vary by product line or vertical? Understand that and really build great buyer personas. Understand their coin op, which is a phrase we use from Modern Sales Foundations. What are their challenges, opportunities, impacts of the current state, needs that they've got that would get them to the outcomes they want, and then how would they prioritize those needs and outcomes? If you can create that kind of, of general marketing persona, sales has to go deeper than that when they actually make contact with the real people but starting from that understanding about what is really driving the buyers who buy what we sell and who have the problems that we can solve. And if you can get that, that informs the way you approach these buyers from a prospecting perspective when you sell. It informs who you want to make sure that you do have in your deals so you don't get caught by a veto surprise later from someone who was lurking behind the scenes. And then content, holy cow. So imagine if we think about buying process exit criteria, right? You've got a buying process. The process has stages and stage names. There are tasks or activities in every stage that need to be performed. And then there's this geeky thing called exit criteria, which means what has to be done in that stage before you can move forward. Now, if you apply that to these buyers, buying process exit criteria, is what do these buyers, what do each one of these individuals need to see, hear, feel, understand, or believe in the current stage to feel comfortable moving forward to the next stage? So all of a sudden, marketing 
needs to be brilliant here. From their research of the personas and from what sales can provide to them and educate them as well, we need to be able to build content. And that content, as you know, can be multiple kinds of forms. It can be a document. It could be a case study. It could be a video. You know, it, it, it could be almost anything that answers that question. What does this persona in this stage need to see, hear, feel, understand, or believe to move forward? And so the content that, that marketing creates and provides to the sellers ought to answer the questions that buyers are asking that they need to know to feel comfortable to move forward and make an informed buying decision. And if marketing can build that, and then sales enablement can help the sellers understand how to use that content and go going back to what I said earlier, both front stage and backstage, man, you can take so much more control of the buying process. You can guide buyers through making an effective decision for them. You're operating in their best interest, giving them what they need. Now, will we ever possibly get everything right about a persona and about the content needs in advance? Of course not. But if you can create this content in a way that allows the sellers to customize it when they need to, now you've done something really powerful and marketing and sales are really joined at the hip working together to better serve the customers and help them make good buying decisions. Man, that would, would, wouldn't that be a great world? Absolutely would. So in your book, you write about the building blocks though. So how many blocks are there and, and, and what are they? Okay, so the building blocks of sales enablement came out of more years than I'm going to mention of me trying to figure this stuff out in the real world. And it, they're really all of the elements that need to be in play to operate at the highest level of effectiveness of a sales force. So there are a dozen what I call central blocks in the middle, right? There's you know three across and four rows. Buyer acumen that we've talked about buyer engagement content, the kind of content we've just talked about, sales support content, content that helps the sellers navigate through the process and reminds them. The next row of three blocks is sales hiring, sales training, sales coaching. No surprises there, right? Next one down, sales process, sales methodology, and sales analytics and metrics. Interesting point on process and methodology. CSO Insights did a study a couple of years ago. They showed that the biggest return on investment happens and the biggest change in win rates and quota attainment and plan attainment happen when process and methodology adoption is above 75%. Now think for a second how many organizations you know, Jeff, that process and methodology adoption is that high. Holy cow, we have such a huge opportunity to improve effectiveness there. Anyway, I digress. So the last row of the blocks is sales technology and tools, sales compensation and recognition and reward systems. And then one that gets missed way too often is probably should be as big as all the other blocks, sales manager enablement. Mm. Now, those are the core blocks. They're tied together by systems thinking. The blocks are the things that you need to do, but you need to create systems to execute those blocks in a repeatable, replicable way that produces predictive results. And systems thinking will allow you to do that. And then the last piece is communication management. Communication to the sales force, funneling through sales enablement, and communication internally across all of the cross-functional collaborators that are stakeholders in sales doing incredibly well and support selling in some way. Marketing, sales ops, marketing operations, product groups, whatever it might be, legal, finance. And then for organizations where it makes sense, all of this sits on a platform that I call sales support services. <coughs> Excuse me. Sales support services aren't needed everywhere and, or, or people don't have the budget or resources, but it might be things like a deal desk or a group that responds to RFPs or RFIs if this, you know, the company is in an industry where that's really common. Uh, it might be coaching services. It, it could be meeting preparation or research, right? And all of that together 
combined or what I call the building blocks of sales enablement. I found that if you get those elements and those performance levers firing at least 80 percent, you can radically change the performance of your sales force. Yeah, it's easy to see why you're so successful. Uh, and uh, for those that want to get a copy of the book, where would they go? Uh, it's right out on Amazon, Building Blocks of Sales Enablement by uh, me truly, Mike Kunkel, K-U-N-K-L-E. Felix Kruger of a company called FFWD uh, in Australia has just published uh, in collaboration with me a learning experience, an online course on the building blocks as well. So if someone out there is interested in starting or evolving a sales enablement practice that actually delivers bottom line results, check out the course. It's at go, G-O, forward, F-F-W-D, G-O-F-F-W-D dot com forward slash blocks. And that's uh, Felix's company. He's uh, I've licensed the content to him, but I'm also working with him. And uh, we're going to try to help sales enablers take things up a notch in 2023. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much for being on the program, enlightening our listeners on the importance of sales effectiveness in the modern digital age. Uh, so Mike Uncle, Vice President of Sales Effectiveness for Sparks IQ. Thanks, Mike, for being on the program. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a blast. Absolutely.